Everything in this video is not intended as financial or investment advice and is for educational purposes only. I'm Joshua Switch, the head of research at Valkyrie, and let's take a look at the midweek market update. Not too much happening in the markets over the past week. It's always good to take a look at everything anyway. A little temperature check, make sure nothing's breaking, nothing's happening that's unusual in any regard. Going to open with the correlations to legacy, which persist really unperturbed mostly. Now we saw some decoupling uh, yesterday when legacy sort of spilled lower. Bitcoin resisted that to a large degree, as did ETH. And now we have sort of this end of day ramp situation going on in legacy and crypto is also enjoying that. We have an FOMC meeting this week, Fed decision this week. I certainly expect a reaction from everything, even though most people know it's going to happen in that we expect a 25 point, uh, 25 basis point rate hike, I guess is how you'd say that. There's still going to be a reaction here, especially in low volume conditions for crypto. Any catalyst that's going to make algos go crazy, bots go crazy, you're going to see some reaction. You know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to matter, but it's very likely that price is going to react to that. So just be aware. Um, it's important to know, you know, why is price moving? <laughs> because you'll ask, you'll, you'll see people asking, what happened? Is there news? You know, et cetera, et cetera. I also wanted to look at just the DXY correlations. Broadly, BTC has done best. Crypto in general has done best when the DXY is on the decline. Uh, recently, it's been heavily resistant, Bitcoin that is, to any rises in the DXY. So a bit of an interesting sort of counterintuitive correlation, I guess you could say. A rising DXY, historically just on balance, hasn't been too bullish for BTC and certainly been more bearish than anything. Um, so to see us sort of resist that here, maybe Bitcoin morphing into something else, right? I don't know if this uh, is early enough to tell, too early to know, are we a commodity? Are we a currency, right? Do we trade like the FX markets? Do we trade like stocks and equities? Do we trade like gold? Lots of people having those conversations recently, but always interesting to look at the data and see, okay, where, where's the correlation? What's going on here? Doesn't mean it's going to act like that in the future, but it's quite interesting that we've resisted that thus far, uh, where you'd expect bearishness in the face of rising DXY. We don't really see that currently. It's more sideways chop currently price-wise. Looking at some on-chain stuff, starting with the number of transactions in the past week on average, the so seven-day moving average, not too much to comment on here other than we're still slowly on the decline here for transactions per day. We certainly did not see, as I keep saying, anything remotely close to 2018 where everybody left the table, you know, with the last person, please turn the lights out sort of situation. We're still seeing persistent activity despite a lack of, we'll say, exciting price activity. <laughs> We're mainly just sideways, right? And there's still persistent activity going on here. Something else to understand with Bitcoin and Ethereum and anything multi-chain that's getting more complicated and complex, it'll get harder to see this data and take it verbatim. What I mean by that is we have the Lightning Network now on Bitcoin. We have different chains acting as this transactional layer. So yes, transactions per day are declining, per week are declining. This may change, right? This may be related to mining activity, price activity, all sorts of things. On top of that, also we're seeing this rise in Lightning Network capacity. I'll take a look at that in a second. But you'd expect transactions of smaller sizes to take place somewhere else. And you'd expect transactions of larger sizes, so let's say above 10 grand USD, above 100K USD. You'd expect those to happen on uh, the Bitcoin layer. You'd expect cheaper transactions, smaller transactions to happen probably elsewhere, like the Lightning Network. Uh, here's active addresses, which again, Nothing too exciting to necessarily comment on here, other than we're not seeing this massive decline drop off the table. We can even go, I like the monthly average uh, for this on active addresses. We're still within the range. This drop off here was mining related, most likely. This is when the Chinese miner exodus occurred and mining related addresses are certainly baked into this. So right now, you know, this isn't exciting or nothing's exploding one way or the other, right? Just sort of coasting here. Um, addresses with a non-zero balance, always good to look at as well. Continue to see rises in that. So these don't 
necessarily represent individual people, but they do represent addresses that are new over a period of time. You know, again, you can see, you can compare this and contrast this with 2018. We saw this massive drop off for whatever reason, exchanges, partitioning wallets, people leaving, right? I don't know exactly, but you can see the data here showing you a bunch of people came, a bunch of people left, right? That's what it looks like. <laughs> We're certainly not seeing that here. Uh, wallets uh, with the non-zero balance certainly persist and have persisted. And if we look at those transaction counts again against the Lightning Network, Active Address is sort of baked into here because Active Addresses are going to take a hit most likely, as you see, off-chain or layer two, as it's called, capacity increase. And I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one cause and effect relationship, but it is interesting that there's a correlation here between this decline in transaction count in the pink here uh, versus Lightning Network capacity. So Lightning Network is an off-chain layer two bi-directional spug and spug hope <laughs> hub and spoke model uh where it's similar to like an open bar tab where you can have this relationship with an entity and then close it out upon your discretion or their discretion so transactions can continue um, because there's sort of this trust built in i guess you could say between you and an entity and then at a time period of your choosing that channel effectively closes and you settle the tab and that happens on the bitcoin chain so you could have, you know, multiple transactions on Lightning that just don't show up on Bitcoin until that channel is settled and closed. So all this is just to say it's maybe not as bearish as you might think just looking at this uh, for, at face value. Bitcoin hash rate absolutely skyrocketing still. Again, this was the Chinese miner exodus where we lost a significant amount of hash rate extremely quickly. The network adjusted was resilient. We didn't really see any effects of that uh, operationally, I guess you could say. The network continued on. And since then, we've seen this explosion rebound of hash rate all over the world that isn't China, but mainly in the United States, mainly where there's cheaper, cleaner energy all over the United States. Also interesting that hash rate is rising regardless of price here. You know, you're seeing this just groundswell of interest and opportunity for a lot of people looking to get into mining in a bigger way. I think those two just are agnostic of price, which is why I think you're seeing this. But again, if you're comparing and contrasting this to 2018, we haven't yet seen this massive price-related dip of hash rate. This was 2018. Potentially miners going somewhere else, miners getting priced out. You know, they have electricity costs, they have overhead that they have to pay. If they can't pay that, they can choose to, you know, take out a loan and keep going or to say, you know, we're going to stop at this point in time and wait for better conditions. I had said that the rising energy costs may have an impact on hash rate, it doesn't look like that they, they have yet, right? Miners at scale don't pay for electricity like we do, don't pay for hardware like we do. They pay months in advance. They have contracts months in advance. So we may not see those effects until much later, but it's something to consider. You know, what, what, are, what are miners doing? They're converting electricity into BTC, basically, or electricity into ETH. So eventually those, those energy costs are gonna kick in. Now, if they're mega profitable, which they are with price at a certain level currently, you know, they're not, they're maybe not as worried about rising energy costs, but miners who are less, less efficient certainly are. Another interesting one to check always balances on exchanges because let's be honest here, no one sends crypto to exchanges unless they're selling, most likely. You know, for me personally, anecdotally, I don't move stuff to an exchange unless I'm selling it. Now, there are certainly more complicated and complex transactions that happen on exchanges these days, lending derivatives, those sorts of stuff. But again, we can look at compare and contrast this and say, what did this look like in 2018? What does it look like now? Do we see a massive rise in float on exchanges effectively? You know, crypto that could be sold. We don't. We saw this crescendo and all-time high essentially in uh, balances on exchanges at the COVID low, March low, which you could say, you know, this might represent capitulation. A bunch of people said, I got to send this to an exchange because I got to sell it, right? Certainly not seeing that yet haven't seen that yet we're seeing the opposite in fact we're seeing just a continuous decline in btc sitting on exchanges this is now a multi-year low dating all the way back to 2018 so pretty impressive again if the general sentiment was perhaps more bearish for holders you'd expect a rising exchange balance you'd expect more and more deposits on exchanges to be sold to cash not seeing that currently
Something else to check is uh, holdall waves. This is a bit more complex, but this looks at when did the Bitcoin move at a specific price as a percentage of the chain. So you can see when prices get extremely high or increasing, you generally see a lot of near-term activity. This is within the last six months. We saw another one of those spikes at the last all-time high. So currently, again, we're not seeing a spike in coins that have moved in the past six months, which means we're not seeing you know, people deposit on exchanges. You're not seeing it. Uh, one thing that is interesting, if you look at when the coins last moved, what price they were, that lines up with between 38 and 39,000, uh, which currently is representing 5% of the coins that have moved and is the largest slice of all of this at price. So this is all the way from zero to, to all-time high. Most of the coins have moved at this price point. So for me, as more of a trading lens, I look at this and say, okay, this is a critical level for supply and demand equilibrium. If we start to see prices above or below, then you can say we're tipping that supply and demand equilibrium one way or the other. Um, but as we sit here now, it certainly looks like there's a lot of activity and interest at this price level. Moving on to ETH, more of the same, really. ETH transactions to me are it's just super impressive and resilient, even with prices doing nothing, essentially, you know, down basically since all time high, obviously, but you're still seeing this just base interest in, in ETH transactional activity on chain, which matches the all time high for on chain activity, the previous all time high in, in January 18. So again, in, in 2018, you saw this massive wave of people coming and going very quickly along with price. You're not seeing that here. You're seeing sustained activity day after day after day. Active addresses recently have been picking up, which is interesting to think because NFT activity, trading activity, really the base, the heart of on-chain activity for ETH has been declining significantly over the past few weeks. Google Trends is another interesting metric to look at. Google Trends for NFTs have declined significantly over the past few weeks. So you maybe wouldn't expect just this pop up here in, in on-chain activity for ETH. Um, fees have come down as a result of just less NFT activity, I guess you could say. But again, this matches the previous all-time high. We're not seeing people coming and going here. This is just persistent on-chain activity. Addresses with a non-zero balance continue to rise. Not seeing any decline in that at all. This is at nearly 77,000. And BTC, you can find it here, was at um, 40,000. So almost double uh, what Bitcoin currently has. BTC and ETH are used for different things. It's kind of comparing apples to oranges, but again, there's no mass exodus of people who maybe have been here since 2021 or prior. Hash rate on ETH as well, absolutely just ripping, ripping, ripping higher in the face of lowering fees, in the face of rising electricity costs. You could probably argue that ETH miners are more sensitive to electricity costs because ETH miners are not ASICs. They're not large mining farms at scale for the most part. For the most part, a lot of this is GPU mining, which is one reason why if you're a gamer like me trying to buy a GPU is, is very hard and has been very hard for many, many months. They're just not available along with the general chip, short, chip shortage going on. So you're seeing a lot of that GPU activity converted into hash rate here, which is why hash rate has just exploded uh, for ETH. And again, you're just doing a check. That's what I'm doing here. Just what's going on? Are miners leaving? No. Are holders leaving? No. Are people who depositing to exchanges? No, not really. You know, this again, just continuous decline in balances on exchanges. It would be easy to say, you know, if I was bearish or wanted to be bearish, I'd say, and if I was seeing a rise in, in balances, I'd say, well, this is worrisome. You know, just like in 2018, we're seeing more and more deposits to exchanges. Again, generally you don't deposit to exchanges unless you're selling. And we're just not seeing this here. You could argue maybe this is a DeFi effect, which it certainly is. There's more stuff to do with ETH that's not on centralized exchanges, but even still, you're not seeing ETH getting sent to exchanges, getting converted to USD. You're just not seeing that. Something else to watch for in ETH's case, DeFi's case is uh, TVL, total value locked. This is the, the amount of dollars sitting in various smart contracts and TVL also essentially flat. Again, not mega declining. This is all chains, by the way, this is ETH, Terra, Avalanche, Solana, so on. And you're not seeing mega declines there. So you're not seeing deposits being ripped out of, of these smart contract either. 
Um, one thing you are seeing, which has been interesting, I mentioned this last week, a continuous, this is stablecoin net exchange flow. So you're seeing a continuous outgoing flow of stable coins. This includes uh, Tether, USDC, and it looks like Coinbase has been uh, sort of leading this exodus as far as this outflow is concerned. Where it's going, I don't know exactly, but it looks like it's a mixture of Coinbase and AnySwap, which is a DeFi product. A little bit of crack in there as well. Binance, Curve Fi, all those have multiple millions exiting over the past week, Coinbase being the largest. And again, this isn't just Tether, it's everything. Tether, USDC, Binance, USD, anything. I don't know what it means necessarily. It's just interesting to look at and perhaps try to figure out. Uh, if we look at USDT versus USD, the price of that has been relatively stable, around 1.0004. <laughs> so not much has changed in that regard. You know, again, I'm just making sure is everything okay? Are we seeing anything weird happening before a price move? And thus far, this stuff looks uh, pretty normal. Moving on to TA for BTC. Again, just more of the same, not much action overall. This is the two-year MA in the green, the multiplier, the 5X multiplier of the two-year MA in the red. This gives you overbought and oversold conditions in a very zoomed out sort of way. Very broadly gives you signals, not investment advice certainly, but it gives you signals for maybe better times to buy or sell, right? If you're trying to time the market. And currently it's not screaming buy, screaming sell. It's just sort of drifting, trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> not much is happening on that front. Um, I'm still looking and following at, looking at and following uh, this pitchfork, which is just, we pick three points, we get a rate of change. If I start to see activity in this, that looks as though price knows it's there, right? That's essentially what I'm saying. Then maybe it's worth paying attention to. So we've got some time here before we run out of road and run out of real estate. But based on this rate of change, um, there isn't any reason to be concerned about anything, right? I don't have anything screaming at me. This looks Again, this doesn't look mega overbought, doesn't look mega oversold. It's within the realm of possibilities projected from 2019 and 2020. If we look at the 5200 cross, you know, trend metrics will tell you we're below the 200, we're bearish. That's just the litmus test. We're certainly well within this cushion of volume, very similar to that UTXO chart where we see an extremely high amount of interest, both buying and selling. Um, anywhere between 33 and 39. So it, when you're above that, you, the read is this should be demand interest perhaps, right? And when you're below a big chunk or node of VPVR, you could say, all right, this is resistance, upcoming resistance. There was a lot of supply activity up here. But just looking at this at face value, massively choppy, right? This range that we're in now is almost bigger than the entire history of Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin ranged between zero and 1K, between 500 and 18K, and now it's in this range, this $15,000 range, right? So that's interesting to think about in and of itself. Uh, but trend metrics definitely leaning bearish here. My thin sliver of bullishness, I guess you could say, is this chart pattern known as an ascending triangle. Now we're getting sort of deeper down the TA rabbit hole, but chart patterns are essentially repeating fractals of price activity that generally carry a bullish or bearish bias. How these triangles typically play out is with a bullish bias. Now, that isn't always the case. I was bearish here, and this looks like a descending triangle to me, right? It's got a floor. It's got a diagonal here of resistance. That went the other way. So this can go either way, right? I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I'm watching the same movie everybody else is, but this does look like it's trying to set itself up for an ascending triangle in some regard. This may continue to fill in this triangle all the way into Q2 and just chop around, right? Uh, for me, as a trader, if I'm in the near term, I stay out of all of this, right? You stay out of all this nonsense and wait till it's above the key resistance level, which is also the 200-day moving average. So there's some confluence of resistance there. And all of these chart patterns carry a measured move or sort of expected target based on this coiling resist uh, coiling consolidation. In this case, between 50 and 55, right? That's a loose guess of a target, but it's based on the depth of the chart pattern. So as long as we're above this diagonal support, I certainly like the possibility of this, this bullish outcome. Something else to look at is uh, Ichimoku Cloud, which is just the dynamic support resistance. It may look confusing if you've never seen it before, but one key trade setup to look for 
is what's called this edge to edge move. And we have four of them, three of them on this chart since uh, 2021. So this was a bearish reversal, a bullish reversal, bearish reversal. And we're setting ourselves up for a potential bullish reversal, which also matches you know, this chart pattern, right? It's no surprise there that we have confluence of targets, confluence of entries, all TA sort of looks at the same stuff. So I do like this setup again to somewhere between 50 and 51, as long as we get a consistent close inside of this cloud, which is effectively acting as resistance at this point in time. You know, just as, as the cloud here acts as support, if we're above it, above, if price is above the cloud, you know, it dipped into the cloud, got supported and finally said, nope, we're, we're falling through, right? That's a similar type of scenario I'm looking for here. Uh, real quickly, moving to alts. Alts have lost a little bit of ground against BTC. This is Bitcoin dominance. So this is Bitcoin market cap versus everything else on market cap. You can see here where Bitcoin's 43% of total market cap in all of crypto. We have a technical golden cross here. It's a 5,200 cross. For the most part, Bitcoin has done better when it's above the 200 day moving average. So it's certainly possible that you're going to see dominance pop up a little bit more significantly as you did maybe in 2018 and 2019. The narrative is certainly there for BTC right now. You know, the narrative for NFTs is a little murky globally, I'd say. You know, the narrative for DeFi, a little murky globally. The narrative for using BTC as a payment rail globally, uh, specifically in Ukraine, you know, that's a massive narrative right now. So it it's not out of the question to see uh, BTC gaining ground here. If you look at ETH and that similar MA multiplier chart, ETH is a little bit more murky. You know, it doesn't give you these pinpoint entries per se. Uh, we are currently sort of cruising below. This is the one year MA in this case in the multiplier. It does give you pretty good oversold condition or overbought conditions, right? It's hinting at oversold here, but you know, it did so in 2018 for a year before <laughs> it finally flattened out. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, ETH price wise, you know, again, not a lot happening here, just sideways chop. If I have to draw something, maybe this is some sort of triangle, just a very aggressive diagonal resistance. And potentially we're coming to an equilibrium here. Just as with BTC, you don't want to see lower lows. Lower lows very likely mean, as they do within BTC, a retest of mid-2021 lows, in ETH's case, around 1800. So we do have some supports for pretty much everything, you know, on the downside. Even DeFi, uh, this is the DeFi perp. This is an index of the high market cap DeFi coins by market cap. So this is mainly Uniswap, a lot of Uniswap as a percentage of this. Um, but again, you don't necessarily want to see lower lows unless you have some sort of fractal chart pattern forming. Arguably, you do have this falling wedge component here, which does carry a bullish bias. When I say it carries a, bull, a, a bias one way or the other, that's just based on statistics of looking at examples of these patterns, uh, both in legacy and crypto. Uh, Bul Bulkowski did some great work on this, but you're seeing this falling wedge, you're seeing this um, rising RSI trend line, which tells you there's a bullish divergence here. You're seeing less momentum on lower prices. We're potentially catching a bid in this, this VPVR area as well. The caution here broadly is we're out of this, this mega range that DeFi has been in since, since January, 2021. We're starting to get out of it at least. So that's a problem. You know, you're safer in a range than you are breaking ranges. On the flip side, we're potentially rubber banding or going to rubber band back to where the high volume area is on this pair, which is around 10 K. So I don't have a strong read on this one way or the other, but if you forced me to make a trade, I'd say bull div falling wedge. That looks like a decent long setup to me. Stop loss below 5,500, right? Not trading advice, but you know, that's one way you can interpret ranges like this. It's hard to get bearish at the bottom <laughs> because you expect uh, support to kick in, hopefully. So that's all I have for this one. Would you like what I miss? Let me know in the comments below. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.